Welcome back, everyone. Today, we're going to be talking about hypothesis testing. Now, when we collect a statistical sample, we can do two things with it. Most of what we've talked about so far in our videos has involved using samples to provide an estimate of a population parameter that we're interested in. But we can also use statistical samples to test hypotheses about a population parameter. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So today's video will be about the basics of hypothesis testing. What do we do when we test a statistical hypothesis? Well, in general, we follow four steps. The first is to state a null hypothesis. We then collect our sample and compare the data in the sample to what we would expect to find if the null hypothesis were true. If the data in the sample are highly unusual compared to what we would expect if the null hypothesis is true, then we would reject this null hypothesis as not being consistent with the data. So these are the basic steps that we follow when we test a statistical hypothesis. And in today's video, we're going to go through each of these steps in a little bit more detail. So first of all, what are statistical hypotheses? Statistical hypotheses are just simple statements about our population. So for example, the population mean is equal to 100 millimeters. These are pretty different from biological hypotheses, which are usually statements about the existence or causes of a particular natural phenomenon, usually implying some sort of underlying biological mechanism. So for example, populations of rabbits are limited by the abundance of predators. Now in statistical hypotheses, we have one of two options, a null hypothesis and an alternate hypothesis. And these two go together all the time. Null simply means nothing. This is a hypothesis that's made simply for the purpose of argument and for testing, but it's generally not believed to be true. Usually null hypotheses imply no effect. So they typically state no preference, no effect, no correlation, no relationship. And null hypotheses then just represent a specific statement that we would be actually interested in rejecting. Usually the more interesting scenario is when the null hypothesis is rejected. And the way that we denote a null hypothesis is with this notation H naught or H sub zero. So here are some examples of different null hypotheses. We might have a null hypothesis that says that the mean body temperature of a healthy human is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Or in the 1970s, a biogeochemist named, named Evel Gorham stated that peat accumulates in soils at 20 grams per, of carbon per meter squared per year, doesn't matter where you look or in what ecosystem you're measuring it. So we might have as a null hypothesis that peat accumulation rates are equal to 20 grams of carbon per meter squared per year. We might also state a null hypothesis to be that there is no difference in abundance of small mammals between logged and unlogged forests, that there is no difference in the number of seeds produced between columbine plants growing at high and low elevation, or maybe that there's no correlation between androgen levels and aggressiveness in red squirrels. These examples of null hypotheses would each then have a corresponding alternate hypothesis. And this is denoted with H sub A. Now, usually alternate hypotheses include the biological relationships that we're actually more interested in, that we actually think are true. As opposed to the null hypothesis that's really specific, alternate hypotheses typically encompass all of the other possible options or outcomes. So for example, we might state a null hypothesis that there's no difference in the density of dolphins between areas with and without drift net fishing. So in this case, the null hypothesis is very specific. We're hypothesizing that the density of dolphins is exactly the same between these two different areas. The alternate hypothesis is much more general. In this case, our alternate hypothesis might be that the density of dolphins differs between areas with and without drift net fishing. We're not being specific about exactly what those densities are, 
just that they're different. And they could actually be different in many, many different ways. So the null hypothesis is very specific, but generally not interesting to us. The alternate hypothesis, on the other hand, is much more general and all-encompassing, and it's generally more closely related to the biological principle that we're actually interested in testing, or that we actually believe to be true. So just like the null hypotheses that we had before, each of those would have a corresponding alternate hypothesis. So the alternate hypotheses then might be that the mean body temperature of healthy humans is actually different from 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, or that peat accumulation rates are different from 20 grams of carbon per meter squared per year, or perhaps that the abundance of small mammals is different between logged and unlogged forests, that there is a difference in the number of seeds produced between columbine plants growing at high and low elevations, or that there is in fact a correlation between androgen levels and aggressiveness in red squirrels. So whereas null hypotheses state the absence of a relationship or the absence of a difference or values equal to some expected standard, alternate hypotheses are typically about differences or relationships. So why are null hypotheses so boring? Why do we create this straw man hypothesis that we don't actually believe to be true in order to perform our statistical tests. Well, what we'll learn in a subsequent video is that when we perform our statistical tests, the cards are actually stacked in favor of the null. This is our default hypothesis. And if we want to actually reject this hypothesis and move on to claim evidence for an alternate, we're actually gonna need to have some pretty strong evidence against it. So we create this null hypothesis, which is like our default conclusion that we're, that we're not going to reject unless we have really strong data to the contrary. So this is sort of why we create these funny little hypotheses that kind of claim no effect or no relationship or no difference. So let's return then to our basic steps in our hypothesis testing framework. We've already stated the null, in previous videos, we've talked about how we might collect a statistical sample. So the next thing we wanna do is to compare the data in the sample to what we would expect to find if the null hypothesis were true. We can then use that comparison to try and determine whether the data are really unusual compared to what we would expect if the null were true. And if the data are really unusual, we would then reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternate. To do this, we're gonna work through a practical example of a study that looked at handedness in European toads. And what I mean by handedness is just like the way that humans are handed, some wild species actually do have a preference to use one paw over the other or one foot over the other. And so the researchers that were involved in this study were interested in trying to determine whether left-handed and right-handed toads are equally common in the population. So that was their research question. From that research question, they then developed a null hypothesis and an alternate hypothesis. Remember the null hypothesis usually says no effect or no difference. In this case, the null hypothesis is that left and right-handed toads are equally frequent in the population, no difference between left and right-handed toads in terms of their abundance. The alternate hypothesis that then goes along with this suggests that left and right-handed toads are not equally frequent in the population, that they differ in their frequency. And so what the researchers did then was to collect a statistical sample of 18 toads, test them for the preference for which foot they prefer to use, and they found that 14 of the 18 toads were right-handed, while four were left-handed. So we want to ask ourselves, are these results actually unusual? What would we expect to see if the null hypothesis were true, and we were sampling from this population, 
getting samples just by chance that differ from one another a little bit from sample to sample just by chance. More specifically, we want to answer the question, what is the probability of getting results that are as extreme or more extreme than this just by chance if the null hypothesis were true? Now, if we were a clever statistician, we might be able to use some fancy equations to calculate this directly based on the observations in the sample. And statisticians have done that, and we'll get to some of these fancy equations later on in the course. But for now, we're going to use what I might refer to as Andrew's simple brute force approach. And that is that we can create our own sampling distribution. So if the null hypothesis is true, and the, the right-handed toads are as common in the population as left-handed toads, then we could randomly sample from this population thousands of times, each time collecting a statistical sample of 18 observations and measuring how many of those 18 observations were right-handed and how many were left-handed just by simulating data. And so we don't have to use any fancy equations. We can just simulate data and see how much the samples vary from one to another in terms of the number of right-handed toads that we would get out of a sample of 18 toads. Okay? And if we do this many, many, many times, a thousand times or 10,000 times, we get a nice distribution that looks like this. Most of the time we're going to get nine right-handed toads out of 18 that are measured. But you can see that just by chance we might get as many as 15 or as few as two or three toads that are right-handed within our sample of 18. Sampling from a population that is evenly split 50-50 between left and right-handed toads but just by chance, we could happen to get a sample that contains 15 right-handed toads. Now, there's not a very large chance that that happens, but it could happen. So what we need to do then is compare our observed statistical sample to this distribution of possible samples that we might get when the null hypothesis is true. Okay. So our expectation under our null hypothesis is that 50% of the toads in the sample would be right-handed and 50% would be left-handed. And we can see that when the null hypothesis is true, this is the most common observation. But what we in fact observed in our statistical sample is that 14 of the 18 toads were right-handed. And there's actually only about a 2% chance for any one sample that you're going to get 14 out of 18 right-handed toads when the null hypothesis is true. And that means that right-handed and left-handed toads are equally common in our population. So this seems like a pretty rare observation, but we're not quite done yet. But remember, what we really want to know is not just the probability of getting 14 out of 18 right-handed toads, but we need to consider also the probability of getting observations that are even more extreme than this when the null hypothesis is true. So we need to consider not only the probability of getting 14 out of 18 right-handed toads, but also the probability of getting 15, 16, 17, or 18, all of the possible observations that are as extreme or more extreme than our sample. So in addition to considering the probability of our observation and all of the more extreme values in the direction of more right-handed toads, we also need to consider values that are as extreme or more extreme in the opposite direction. So the complement to 14 out of 18 right-handed toads would be 4 out of 18 right-handed toads. So in order to consider or to calculate the probability of getting an, a sample as extreme or more extreme than this, 
we need to consider both sides of the sampling distribution, both the upper end and the lower end. And now that we've considered all of the ways in which we could get a value that's as extreme or more extreme than this observed value, we can combine these probabilities together into what's called a p-value. The p-value is simply the probability of getting the observed data in the sample if the null hypothesis were in fact true. So we can calculate this probability as the sum of all of these probabilities from these different outcomes that were as extreme or more extreme than what we observed. And if we sum all of these probabilities together, we calculate a p-value of 0.031. Now, if you remember our principles of probability, we sum these probabilities together because we're interested in the probability of observing four out of 18, or three out of 18, or two out of 18. All of these or combinations mean that we add up the probabilities in each of these possible outcomes to calculate our overall p-value. So we can calculate then that there's only a small chance, a 3% chance, that we would get data like this if the null hypothesis were in fact true. So now that we've calculated our p-value, what do we conclude? Well, our p-value tells us that there's only a very small chance of getting data like the data we got if the null hypothesis is true. So instead, we would conclude that the null hypothesis is probably false. But how small does p have to be to be considered small? Well, by convention, a p-value less than 0.05 in biology is generally considered to be small. If that p-value is less than 0.05, then we reject the null hypothesis and instead accept the alternate hypothesis. So what we've done in this video then is to walk through the basic steps of a hypothesis test. We start by stating a null hypothesis. We collect our statistical sample. We compare our observed data to what we would expect to find if the null hypothesis were true. And if our observed data are highly unusual compared to the data that we would be likely to get if the null hypothesis were true, then we reject that null hypothesis as being highly unlikely and instead accept the alternate hypothesis.